Here now is Matt Austin and Ginger Gadston with Florida's Fourth Estate. Sponsored by Light Orlando, delivering hope together. He oversaw one of Florida's most infamous cases. This is the case of the state of Florida versus Casey Marie Anthony. The nation watched as Casey Anthony was accused of killing her two-year-old daughter, Kaylee. It's an important thing to boycott Casey. Then, as a jury decided her fate. We, the jury, find the defendant not guilty. And as she walked out of the Orange County Jail, a free woman. <laughs> Today, we're speaking with former Judge Belvin Perry about what it was like to preside over the case and some of the behind-the-scenes things you've never heard before. We are so happy to have Judge Belvin Perry in the house with us in living color. Thank you so much for being with us for Florida's Fourth Estate. You know, you're one of the few judges where people, they know, when they say your name. Instantly. Anywhere you go, I don't, I can't think of a handful of judges I can name or talk to other people about. So we're glad that you are stopping by Florida's Fourth Estate to chat with us today because there's a lot to talk about. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's our pleasure. I mean, I remember I came to know you through uh, just from watching you on the Casey Anthony trial. You've been involved in some major trials, not just that one. You were involved in putting away the Black Widow, one of the most infamous serial killers, specifically female serial yeah. killers, who was eventually put to death in Florida for the first time since like 1848 or something like that. A female was put to death. So you have some amazing stories to tell, and that's why we wanted to bring you in here. I remember. Uh, specifically one statement you always made at the beginning of the trial <laughs> in Casey Anthony and I was I was sitting there covering it as an anchor and I would always say it with you ladies and gentlemen of the jury did you heed my previous admonitions <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I have to ask first where did you get that from is that your own thing or did you did you get that from another judge yes Basically uh, from me. Uh, <laughs> That's what you wanted. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody even made a coffee mug. Did they? It, yeah. Okay, so it was something unique to you. Yes. You know, so when did you realize that when you got the Casey Anthony case that it was a game changer? Because it was. You know, I had been following the case all along uh, with Judge Strickland, who was the assigned judge of the case. Uh, and I was doing some things in the background uh, to arrange for a change of venue and looking at possible alternatives. Uh, so I really learned that he may recuse himself, at least grant the motion, when I was in Tallahassee attending the Florida legislative session. And I received a call uh, from Judge Reginald Whitehead, who was the administrative judge in criminal, and said, Belvin, uh, the defense has filed a motion to have Stan recused. Uh, and I said, okay, I'm on my way back to the hotel. Could you email it to me and, and I'll read it and we can discuss it. So I got back to my hotel, turned my computer on, read the motion. Uh, and I looked at it and I said, do you know what Stan is going to do? He said, no, I don't know what he's going to do. And I looked at it and I said, well, based upon the four corners of the motion, I think he has no choice but to grant it, but we'll see what he does. And I said, well, if he uh, grants the motion, who is going to be the lucky person that you're going <laughs> to assign this case to? He said sarcastically. <laughs> and because uh, I had no earthly idea that it would end up being me. Even though I was the chief judge, I always let the administrative judge take care of the reassignments in their division. He said, well, we need someone that has the time to do it, someone that can ride herd on these lawyers, uh, and uh, someone who won't let the media glare get in their vision. I said, I said well, who is that? You checked all three boxes. <laughs> He's <laughs> describing you. And uh, he said, you. I said, what, you? <laughs> he said, well, you are my boss. And if you tell me not to, I will. I say, Reggie, you do what you need to do. And so it begins. Yeah, yeah. the and rest is history. And at what say. point in that case, I mean, I'm sure you knew going into it, it was going to be crazy. But when you, when you accept it, at what point were you like, what did I get myself into here? It was about maybe 60 days in, I, I began to realize how much work it would involve because 
there was a lot of moving parts to it. Of course, the legal part of it, mm -hmm. but the logistics of dealing with a case that would last between six to eight weeks, the location, how do you keep a jury sequestered for that mm. period of time, and what do you do with them? You know, okay. people forget they are locked up. They can't communicate. So, uh, one of, I think one of the most brilliant things happened was uh, Karen Levy, who was our uh, uh, director of communications at the time, came up with this brilliant idea about why don't we form a media committee and let them set the rules that you must approve and you can add or subtract. And the media was absolutely wonderful. They basically mapped out a plan as to who would get seats, how would folks get seats. And even when they found out where the jury was staying, they did not publish it. We had no problem with them following jurors. And they learned that they were out at Rosen Shingle Creek, and uh, Harris Rosen was just tremendous when we talked to him. Great guy. He gave us an uh, excellent uh, deal on the rooms, gave us everything we wanted, uh, even structured the meal prices to fit within the per diem, which oh is gosh. unheard of. Wow. Uh, they even changed the locks on the doors from the stairwell so that you, usually you can go down the stairwell and go to another floor. On the floor that they were on, you couldn't access the floor wow. from outside. Wow. That I didn't really know any of that. No, but that's a safety issue too, not just a privacy issue, but these jurors were so high profile like some person who could have something already in their mind, you know, could want to harm them in some way. Uh, they made off limits uh, at certain time. Uh, a certain swimming pool, so if the jurors wanted to swim, they had uh, sole access to uh, the exercise facilities uh, between uh, 5 and 7 a.m. They were magnificent uh, uh, with everything. They even programmed the televisions, which I did not know until they told me, uh, where only the channels that did not show news. Wait, hold on. Because <laughs> I'm always, whenever I've heard of jury sequester, yeah, I've always thought like, they're uh, watching the news course, at night and seeing course. how the day went and what they couldn't do and it. See what people are saying. They oh couldn't my do gosh. It. And oh. at the end, because we monitored those stations, there were it got down to about uh, three stations: Home Shopping Network, <laughs> uh, uh, HL the the. One of those home shows. Okay. Because at the end, everybody. HGTV did, or something? HGTV. Oh, yeah, like home improvement. Yeah. They were running, tick, most of the stations close to the end start running ticker tape highlights. Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Uh, staff would uh, cut out the paper for them because they were all from the Tampa area. We would let them read the Tampa paper. We had to. But cut the cut anything out. out of this it. sounds like a movie because you see the pe they open the newspaper in their holes. I, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> And one of the most trickiest things is most folks don't know was, you know, we didn't lose a single juror. And one of the things that we did was we, we let them have visits on the weekends. Most people didn't know that. From just select family members? A family member or your significant other. It only could be one. <laughs> you got one visitor on the weekends. And... Uh, you know, and, and most folks were saying, well, are you going to restrict it to the day room where they all got, we had a, a big suite. I said, you know what? These are adults. We made sure that the person that visited them signed certain agreements where they agreed not to ask and discuss anything about the case. The jurors were instructed. Uh, that they could come starting on Saturday afternoon. They just needed to be out by midnight. Okay, Seven so nine. I'm hearing conjugal visits is what you're saying. I hear it. That's the first no. thing I hear. See, I was thinking it and she said <laughs> it, Judge. 
<laughs> I don't I'm know what asking. these folks. <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know what they play. Domino. <laughs> sure. Listen to music. How long did what this what last? Yeah. <laughs> How long did this all go on and you think they're playing dominoes? Okay. I don't know what they did and I don't care to know what they did. All I know was I wanted jurors not to feel like they were prisoners. Sure. We tried to make it yeah. as less painful as possible. Yeah. It seems like as much as you could. Now, it's, as much as these people's lives were upended, I would imagine there had to be some changes for you. People, as the judge, I would imagine there were probably some threats because everybody's watching every day and very invested in this. And like you're not a man who can hide in public or, or anywhere. <laughs> yeah. Like if I see you out very in the real world, we're gonna know who you are. Well, I give you a couple of examples. Uh, one day we got out of court, and for whatever reason, I went by Ross on uh, Michigan. And I went in and I was looking for a pictures frame. So when I got home, my daughter called me. She said, Daddy, somebody recorded you in Ross. Oh my gosh. And they posted it on uh, Facebook. He's just like us. <laughs> he goes to Ross. <laughs> and uh, I will never forget there was one uh, Sunday. Uh, a group of us had gone to church at Macedonia and a, a very close friend of ours was having a reviewing. So we went to uh, the Italian restaurant in Millennium Mall, Brio's. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was about maybe eight or ten of us and I was sitting there at the menu and then something says, look up. <laughs> <laughs> I looked up. Everybody in there had a cell oh. phone. Oh, jeez. Wow just recording me. Doing what you would normally do. You were <laughs> trying to have not dinner. Allowed to eat. <laughs> I, I, I was trying to figure out what I was going to eat. So, yeah. uh, so basically I had to stop going to the grocery store. Uh, if I did go eat, I had to go eat at certain places where I could be left alone. And uh, could go anywhere. And it probably kept up for a while. Like I would imagine the trial ended, but you were still over, maybe it was even crazier after that. Well, I, I give you a perfect example. When the trial was over with, uh, my mother-in-law before she passed was very ill. So my grandson and I were driving uh, to Birmingham, Alabama. And so I stopped uh, at a service station in Valdosta to gas up. We went inside the little convenience store. The next thing I know, people were pointing. Mm. And then they just finally came up to me, aren't you that case Anthony Judge? Mm -hmm. And it was just like that uh, in Birmingham, any place I went, yeah. in the airport, on the airplane, uh, it was just that way for a number of years and uh, it has settled down a great deal, but still every now and then somebody will come up to me. Stay with us as former Judge Belvin Perry talks about becoming an accidental celebrity his thoughts on the approach Casey Anthony's attorneys took in the courtroom and whether or not he keeps in touch with any of the key players. Welcome back to Florida's Fourth Estate. We've been talking about some of the incredible behind the scenes moments of the Casey Anthony trial with the judge who was at the center of it all. So does he keep in touch with anyone from the case? What does he think of how Jose Baez approached the jury? And what was it like to be an accidental celebrity? Before your name became a household name, the only judge I honestly can remember that I knew by name, and most of Americans knew by name, was, you know who I'm going to say, Judge Lance Edo. You know. Yeah, and so you became that, that guy who couldn't go anywhere. Was it kind of, I mean, you have a family, but was it kind of a lonely existence for a while? Because you couldn't really do anything that you really, just regular stuff. Well... It was lonely, but when, when you look at it, I really didn't have that much time to do anything. Mm. Uh, I was in the courthouse every morning uh, by 8.15 because the lawyers knew if there were things that they needed to bring up that they needed to let the court deputy know by 8.20. Everyone would assemble by 8.30, and they had uh, 25 minutes to bring up whatever they wanted to bring up because we were going to start at 9 a.m. sharp. So uh, when I would leave, I still had my day job to do. 
Uh, as I'm sorry, could, what? I still had my day job. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't your only yeah. thing? No. You still were the boss of the judges of the ninth district. I, I still had my day job to do. And then by the time I got home, maybe about maybe eight, I would relax and uh, get a little bite to eat. And then around 9, 30, 10 o'clock, I started looking over my notes for the next day. Yeah, it's wow. wild. So, it's all consuming. So as that is put to bed and done now, mm -hmm. what do you think it's done for you personally, for your career? I mean, it made you a household name. Are, are you are you glad you were involved in it in the end, or are you, you could have skipped it? You know, <laughs> what, what, what's your feeling on that whole time in your life? I, I think it was a great experience uh, uh, for me. I, I think it opened up to the world how the judicial system works. Mm -hmm. You got a chance to see firsthand. Uh, uh, most people didn't agree with the outcome of the case, but at least they saw what happened. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think it is very important uh, that courts that are open to the public, the public gets a chance to see it firsthand. Now, does publicity make it difficult to get jurors? Yes. But there's a trade-off uh, because you don't want to ever have a star chamber type proceeding because if people don't see what happens in a court proceeding and can fix their own opinions and not uh, rely upon pundits to give opinions. That makes the system, in my opinion, stronger. What is the day after the Casey Anthony trial ends for you like? Because I can't, you know, you're, that's the highest high. And so now, next. Pool? You got a pool? <laughs> I had planned. Uh, to take off two weeks. But about 10 days before the case of Anthony trial ended, uh, one of my judges, who were named nameless, <laughs> decided that he was going to retire uh, in about 20 days. Uh, and I basically said, that doesn't give me any time to find a replacement mm -hmm. to, for the governor to act for the committee. So I had two days off after that. Oh, God. man. <laughs> and then I had to assume a full-fledged criminal division. Are you still friends with that judge? Because <laughs> 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 that is terrible. Yes. <laughs> Are you okay? Do you keep tabs? <laughs> do you keep track? Do you talk to anybody from that? Like, especially, I know, aside from Casey Anthony, Maybe the most talked about person was Jose Bias. Oh yeah. You know, do you? Or how is it? I know when you're a judge and there are lawyers. Can you have? Can you be friends with anybody? How does that work? You know, I have not. I think I may have run into Mr. Bias one time uh, in passing mm -hmm. uh, since the trial. Uh, but uh, but. Other than that, no. Yeah, yeah. But no, no, but I don't even. You I guess guys aren't you, texting. Yeah, you guys, no, I don't know because no. he was. I was. He caught. He, like he was kind of under the microscope for his legal prowess. Some people thought he was terrible. Oh yeah. Some thought he was a genius. So I, I don't want to make you comment on anything that. Uh, well, you know, uh, Jose Baez, at the time, probably wasn't the, the, the sharpest person on the evidence code, but he was well prepared. And he did something uh, that uh, good lawyers do. Once he determined the, the makeup of the 12 people in that jury, he tailored his case to fit them. Mm -hmm. It's just like a great football coach. You go into any game with a game plan, but you must make adjustments. And Baez made those adjustments. And he learned how to play to the jury. But you know, now they have shows like there's Bull on CBS where that's the guy's job. It's like find out who these people are and let's get to them. And Baez did that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's great. That's well, you good. are delightful. I'm so happy you made time for us today. You made a lot of time. <laughs> we, we, we have really yeah. been in here for a while. Thank you. It really okay. is a pleasure to meet you. Okay. Yeah. Felton Perry. Thank you so nice much. Very nice to meet you. Very nice. Oh my gosh. So nice to okay. meet you. Yes.
And thank you for watching Florida's Fourth Estate. You can download it from wherever you listen to podcasts or watch anytime on News 6 Plus.